The Porsche 924 is nearly 50 years old, but it's still as aerodynamic as cars these days. We simulated it at 90 miles per hour, and its drag coefficient was just 0.30, back in the 70s. That's better than a lot of cars these days, and about as good as a new 911 today. In this video, we'll go through why it's so aerodynamic, despite being designed when car aerodynamics wasn't nearly as developed as what they are now. One of your amigos, actually, Theodore, commissioned us to investigate this car through our Simulate Your Own Car section on our website. You can do the same here. So this plane cuts through the centerline of the car and is colored in the velocity in meters per second. And this plane alone gives us a really clear idea as to why this car is freakishly aerodynamic for its time. In the zoomed out view, the flow travels around it really well. It's almost like this car is an arrow traveling through the air sleekly. Zooming into the details, there are a number of important points. The first is the front. One of the major strengths of the car aerodynamic wise is just how pointy the front is. That alone greatly reduces the drag because you can see just how little of the flow crashes into the front and decelerates. As a result, looking at the pressure plot, we get a tiny region of high pressure flow here. Literally only the flow in front of the license plate experiences close to stagnant flow. Everywhere else on the nose experiences high pressure, but not nearly as high. This directly reduces the drag because you have less high pressure pushing the car back. In fact, if you'd like to reduce the drag of a car even more, removing the number plate would help. And because it's for aerodynamics, I think everyone would be okay with that. This is even more impressive than last week, where we saw the Santa Fe flaunt a very pinched nose and the subsequent benefits it reaped. Here, this pointed nose is even more exaggerated, and that's even better. The front bumper is a little difficult to classify as good or bad for aerodynamics though. From the streamlines, it's quite obvious that we get a lot of wake and recirculation from it, particularly with the number plate. The flow comes in, separates underneath it, and we just get a wake. On top is definitely better, but we still have flow coming in and circulating around. While that's bad, the front bumper actually makes the front even pointier because if you remove it, the front has a small, flat face. The bumper being thinner now makes the front sharper and that's better for aerodynamics because that helps pierce the oncoming air and allow the car to slip through it easier. So while it might be tempting to remove the front bumper, that could actually increase the drag. On the other hand, if you were to remove the bumper, the air intakes for the engine could be placed to take advantage of this higher pressure at the front. In fact, the Carrera GT version, a hood scoop, was usually seen on it. The goal of the hood scoop, especially given that it's facing forwards, is to get higher pressure air fitting into the engine. Removing the front bumper will give you that higher pressure you need, and it will now just be a matter of rooting it to the engine. So this front bumper, while it might seem pretty rudimentary, actually has a lot going on. Looking underneath the front, the flow is great, it really is. That is largely because of that sharp front. You can see that the flow that's hitting the front underneath is not too angled to the surface, so it doesn't have to redirect it that much. That does two things. The first is that the flow doesn't decelerate as much, and we don't get as high a pressure here. The second is that the flow can stay attached underneath far easier now, and it does. Both of those things are great for lowering the car's drag. Now, one thing that could be improved here is removing the little lip underneath. Having that lip in front of the front wheels is good in that it can help redirect the flow more around the wheels. That way you don't get as much high speed flow crashing into them and increasing the drag. In other words, they act pretty much like small front wheel spoilers. But having this lip between the wheels only disturbs the flow. It has to jump over it and we get a small weight behind it. It's not too much but it is something, and the drag will increase because of it as well. Over the top of the front, the floor is really good. Porsche did a great job curving the hood, and that in part is partly because of how pinched the nose is again. If the front were blocky, the hood wouldn't have as much space to raise up to give this curved hood. Otherwise, the car would have to be much taller. Because we have this nicely curved hood, the flow's acceleration over it is spread over a much larger distance, you can see here in this velocity plot how the flow definitely becomes redder, so it is definitely accelerating. 
but it's not that much. For example, it's not like how you see over the roof. That's good because the pressure doesn't drop as much. We do still get low pressure, which is just because the flow has to accelerate. There's really no quick fix to that, at least no low drag quick fix, and that creates a little lift, which is not what you want. The benefits of slanting the hood so much continues when you look to the windshield. The angle between them is pretty good. They're much more in line than most cars. So the air can flow from the end of the hood and over the windshield much more seamlessly. Look how there's no wake. There's just a little flow deceleration because the flow has to change angle a little bit, but much of the flow stays above 20 meters per second. And because the hood and the windshield blend together so well, the familiar high pressure zone is there, but it's lower. That means that there's less resulting drag too because the pressure pushing the car back isn't as high as usual. So, so far, there have been a few key regions that indicate why this car is just so low drag. Just quickly, this simulation was done with Open Foam. If you'd like to learn Open Foam, then check out our courses here. We currently have an end of summer special on that I think you might like. Now, moving to the roof, this is one of the few areas of the car that is pretty average. It's not any better or worse than an average car. The flow travels over the top and accelerates a lot. It's probably the fastest here than anywhere else in the flow. With that comes very low pressure. While that doesn't directly affect the drag, it does create a lot of lift, and that's not great for handling. So this region isn't that good. But coming to the rear window, we now have another ambiguous region. So remember that the front bumper was doing good and bad, and whether it was better to remove it or not is not that clear cut. We have a similar thing happening here in this rear window region, and the rear in general. So the rear window slopes down a lot. One of the major benefits of that is you can really shrink the rear face. Porsche really focused on doing that because not only is the rear face shrunk by the sloping the window down, but also the diffuser is aggressive too. So the top and bottom are working to make the rear face as small as possible. The huge benefit of that is you naturally get less drag. The reason is because the rear wake is the worst area for drag. You get low pressure on that face and that sucks the car backwards, increasing the drag. So by reducing that face size, which Porsche did here excellently, you can easily reduce the drag of the car. Bringing this back to the rear window, sloping it down is definitely great for drag because it reduces the rear face size, but looking at the velocity over it, it drops. I can't remember seeing a flow dropping this much over a window. In reality, what's happening is that the boundary layer is thickening a lot. Look at how far away from the car you need to go to hit free stream flow now. In a way, it's impressive that the boundary layer grew that fast. You don't see that every day. It grows that quickly because of the pressure pushing back. And the fact that the pressure increases so much is a little surprising too. I mean, if you were to remove the spoiler, the pressure would increase a little bit going down the back. But this frankly rudimentary spoiler simply provides the flow with a horizontal surface to push into it. And that not only makes it redirect and go horizontal, but also increase the pressure. That's great for downforce production, but the high pressure also pushes back upstream and helps create this incredible boundary layer. So we know now that this thick boundary layer occurs and why, but the last question is, so what? Why is this bad? Well, here there is really only one reason. That's because the wake becomes thicker too. The wake is now the thickness of it from the rear, plus now this boundary layer. And because it's slower, it has an energy deficit, so that's more drag. But because the rear window was already reducing the wake so much, this increase is well worth it, because even with it, the wake is still smaller than if you don't slope the window down. An example of that is a regular hatchback. The rear doesn't shrink down at all, and so the wake is much larger, and the drag is way higher there. So here, while sloping the window down so much comes with its disadvantage, the advantage of the much smaller wake is far better, so it's definitely justified. Now we come to the rear spoiler. It's a little funky looking, but overall, I think it's pretty good. It's a good balance between downforce production and the additional drag you get from it. I say that because if you want to get more downforce out of it, you can always kick it up more, but that will come with more drag. I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure the engineers at the time designed this to be low drag, and it largely works. 
in the drag orbit, there isn't really any real red regions, which tells us that while drag is produced still, it's not that much. Looking at the diffuser, it's really good, even by modern standards. And really, this is one of the key things that makes this car so low drag. Back when this was designed, there were some cars with diffusers this aggressive, but it wasn't that common. One reason why modern diffusers have moved away from being so sharply sloped is the sharper this angle is, the more likely the flow will separate over it. That will then render the diffuser inefficient, downforce will drop, and drag will increase. We can see here that we're very close to the limit, where the flow is kind of separating but then reattaching again. So I think this diffuser was really well designed. As a result, you can see two very important details. The first is that naturally, the rear is so much smaller now, so the rear wake is inherently smaller too, and that means less drag. The second is that in addition to that, the flow is kicked up nicely, which further reduces the wake size and the drag. So this car is definitely one of the most aerodynamic cars of its time. The only thing that could really be improved here is perhaps removing the rear bumper because while the front bumper was actually good, here there is a little aerodynamic benefit to it. All it's doing is getting in the way of the flow that's being directed up by the diffuser. You can see how the diffuser is angling the flow quite sharply, but then the bumper just sticks out. So what is happening here is that the flow is coming in from the diffuser, it has to redirect, and anytime you do that, you lose energy. That's drag. What's more, it kicks the flow more horizontally, so you lose some of that downforce too. The weight also becomes larger, so I think the rear bumper is just bad overall. Now, this was a center plane, and the surprising thing about this car is that if we move over 50 centimeters to the left, the flow is largely the same. That's somewhat unusual because usually, particularly with modern cars, the closer you get to the sides, the more the flow changes. Here, the only major difference is behind the rear wheels, which is very normal. You can see that the large wakes just bum rush into the diffuser and make it perform terribly now. There's not too much that can be done about that. Perhaps adding strakes is the only thing because that will help stop the wake spreading over the diffuser more. Now in this drag orbit, we see that the wheels produce a huge amount of drag. They are by far the worst region of the car. To find out why, we have this plane which is 20 centimeters off the ground. It's very obvious that the wheels are terrible here. The flow hits the front wheel and just blows out into huge wakes. That's impressively bad. I think the reason why this is happening is that if you look just ahead of the wheels, the flow is angled outwards. So the flow enters the underbody and then some of it is directed outwards. That angled flow hits the tire and, unsurprisingly, separates. So we get a huge wake on the side of it. That comes with a lot of drag. And you might think, well, okay, the front wheels have terrible wakes, but at least that means that the rear wheels will be hit by wakes too, and that's less energy that can be dumped into them. Unfortunately, that's not really the case here. The front wheel wakes blow out and effectively clear the rest of the car. So there's faster moving flow here now hitting the rear wheels. That makes them produce large wakes too, but the front wheel wakes, because they are plagued with low pressure cores and are right next to the rear wheels, help suck out the flow more from the rear wheels and further increase their wakes too. So while the rear wheels are producing a lot of drag, part of that is because the front wheels are negatively affecting this region as well. These front wheels are just a bad influence, and much of that comes from the highly angled flow at the front. So why is the flow angled so much then? The flow coming in is straight, and then it turns. Why? Well, ironically, it has to do a lot with the pinched front. So the pinched front is good overall, but by pinching it like this, the curvature to the underbody is spread over a greater distance. So you can see that the underbody is a certain height off the ground, and then the start of the underbody is much higher off the ground. The distance it takes for that contraction to occur is quite a lot, and its location isn't ideal. It's right in front of the front wheels. So as the flow approaches the front wheels, it is being squeezed through a smaller and smaller opening. You can see that its response is to accelerate, which is expected. But like any contraction that is open at the sides, not all the air will go through it. Some will be pushed sideways. As such, the flow is now angled, and that is one of the reasons why flow hitting the front wheels is so angled as well. 
the massive wakes from the front wheels and even the rear wheels are even more bizarre when we move to 40 centimeters on the ground. Look at how good the flow is now. There's almost no wake from the front wheels, so the wheels themselves are okay. It's more the flow conditions that they were working with to begin with. Looking at the back, we see something pretty cool. So there are wakes from the rear wheels and they float underneath the diffuser. But because the diffuser is angled up so much, you can see how fast the moving flow is being sucked underneath it too. That's good in that it provides the diffuser with high energy flow to work with. And that will help the diffuser reduce the wake size by being able to shoot the flow up more. But what this means is that the pressure underneath the diffuser is lower than outside. And that is why the outside flow is being sucked in. So what that means is that we're getting relatively high pressure entering underneath and neutralizing some of the low pressure underneath the diffuser. That results in less downforce being produced. A way to solve that again would be to use drakes. Those will isolate the low pressure underneath the diffuser from the higher outside air. But that will then reduce how well the diffuser can shoot the flow up and reduce the wake size. So there's a trade-off to consider. Either way, the flow in this plane is impressive, it's really good. Moving up to 60 centimeters of the ground, the flow is even better. Everywhere up from the rear is great, there's almost no wake. The only bad part is the front wheel houses. There's a little bit of flow coming out of them, and what that tells us is that this car could really benefit from outlets behind the front wheel houses. That would help siphon off some of the wheelhouse flow and reduce its tendency to blow up the sides. But again, this is quite minor here. The rest of the side is awesome. In fact, the rear edge of the car is shaped how a lot of modern cars aspire to be. It's quite sharp, which gives the flow somewhere to separate from. That reduces the unsteadiness in the wake, and hence the forces on the car are more stable. I think this plane really gives us a good appreciation of just how small the wake is. This is at 90 miles per hour, and the wake is dying out maybe a car length downstream. That's really good, and a testament to how low this car's drag coefficient is. This plane is one meter off the ground, and the flow here is pretty good. I say that because while most of the car seems very streamlined, just behind the rear window, there are a couple small wakes. That's not great, modern cars don't have that, and while they are very small, there is still a little bit of drag being produced from them. So changing the few bad regions on this car, the drag coefficient, which is 0 0.30, could be dropped more, which would be incredibly good for a car from the 70s. For the lift, Remember that this is at 90 miles per hour, so it produced 17.6 kilos, about as much as a large chicken wing. If we scaled this back to what it would produce at 72 kph, like other cars on the list, the lift will come in at around 4.5 kilos, which is decent. The Porsche 924 was definitely ahead of its time in terms of aerodynamics. If you're staying on YouTube, YouTube thinks you'll like this video, so check it out. Peace out, amigos.